Okay, Jim. Fill it right up, boy. It was certainly nice to be able to say that again, and tens of thousands of British motorists took full advantage of the opportunity. Roads out of London, as in the case of other centres, were mostly as crowded as in the good old days before petrol rationing began ten years ago. Brighton was one obvious destination for many Londoners, and if the weather wasn't as good as one always hopes it's going to be for a holiday weekend, well, it might have been far worse. As for the cars, they were everywhere, and naturally enough, with petrol free again, at a price, the drive home from any popular resort was bound to be a motoring procession. Yes, this Whitsuntide holiday was almost pre-war. Car sales boomed in post-war Britain. At the beginning of the 1950s, there were two million cars on the road. By 1959, there were more than five million. The comfortable, convenient car had become a symbol of freedom. Most people could dream of owning one. Yet at this stage, only a select few, one in ten, had a car. But the problems these vehicles caused were immense. People began to use their cars for almost every journey. City streets were lined with vehicles and clogged with traffic. By the 1960s, cars were beginning to dominate nearly every town. There seemed to be no room to park and no room to drive. The symbol of freedom was beginning to enslave society. The dream was turning sour. The boom in car sales was followed by a boom in scrapyards. This was the era of the bypasses, built to take traffic past towns. They helped through traffic, but did little for the towns themselves. Not surprisingly, cars were constantly in the news. Like so many cities, Leicester has traffic and parking problems of its own. Now, traffic wardens, five of them women, the first in Britain, are on the job, helping to sort things out. The introduction of traffic wardens in 1960 did produce a marked improvement, but the obsession with solving the problems of traffic continued into the early 60s. By 1980, we're officially told, there'll be 18 million cars in Britain. It's bad enough with a mere six and a half million. The penalties for being motorised include worry and frustration as well as the fines. We can go underground, or we can make use of a number of new techniques which utilize airspace. But to cope with another 11 and a half million cars, we'll need either a miracle or a fourth dimension. The implication of this has been outlined in a report to the Minister of Transport, and it's pretty ominous. The Minister was Ernest Marples, and the report was Traffic in Towns, better known as the Buchanan Report, named after the civil servant who led the working party. One event which had a bearing on the decision to set up the traffic in town study was the findings of a previous study group. This involved the motor industry, the Treasury and the Minister of Transport, who met to examine the implication of the car maker's determination to step up the relentless production of cars. Buchanan's brief was to study the long-term developments of roads and traffic in urban areas and their influence on the urban environment. He assumed, like most people at the time, that the desire for more cars would have to be met and set about examining what changes would be necessary. The report concentrated on looking at possible ways of adapting four existing towns to fit the car. Traffic in Towns was presented as a well-argued, well-illustrated book written in a style that made sense to the non-specialist. Getting the message to a wider public was part of the plan. Money was even made available to produce a film in which the study team took part and James Cameron presented it. It was a mixed team of specialists, town planners, architects, engineers. This group has now come out with this report, and if anyone can tell us what the problems of the next 50 years are going to be, and what the solution is likely to be, surely Mr. Buchanan should be the man to do it. One thing we feel quite certain about is that solution is not the right term. There are no straightforward answers. This is much more in the nature of a social situation which has to be dealt with by policies applied over a period. But surely there must be some fundamental reason. The trouble really is the traditional arrangement of buildings along streets, which has been the basic form of towns ever since towns began. This arrangement has been put out of date by the motor vehicle almost at a stroke. <laughs> 
The double-sided street, serving for the movement of vehicles, for direct access to premises, and for pedestrians, seems as though it were designed to produce traffic jams and confusion. Contriving accessibility for vehicles is only one part of the problem. The other part is to ensure that there isn't a devastating effect on the surroundings for living, or as we call it, the environment, by the universal presence of motor traffic. There seem to be certain values in towns which we need to reassert. There is the right to be safe from traffic, instead of having to worry constantly about the frightful penalties which a moment's forgetfulness may involve. There is the right to enjoy stimulating surroundings. How can we take a pride in surroundings when so often they can only be viewed through or over a screen of motor vehicles? There is the right to reasonable freedom from the noise of modern traffic. It's hardly an exaggeration to say that one measure of the civilized quality of a place is the freedom with which people can walk about in comfort and safety. Streets are not only for vehicles, many are for living in and being in. The important thing about the Buchanan Report is the way in which it set the scene for discussions and for action with respect to dealing with urban transportation problems and it focused in on the private automobile to the exclusion of virtually everything else. Although Buchanan did talk of historic areas and he talked of public transport, nevertheless these became marginal issues after the Buchanan report and all transportation problems in urban areas were essentially seen as ways of accommodating the private car. The millions of cars needed room to park and room to move. The Buchanan Report was an academic exercise in redesigning towns and cities, as far as possible, to provide for the needs of cars. Leeds was one of the cities studied in the report. Buchanan's working group collected information about where people lived, how they traveled to work, to school, and to the shops. This information was then projected forward 50 years to the year 2010, with the assumption that all the people who wanted a car would have one by then. Diagrams were drawn representing the journeys Buchanan's group assumed people would want to make. They analyzed the three main kinds of P-car journey. First, people going to shop in the center and local shopping districts. Then the journeys done for business purposes. And finally, the pattern of work journeys. If people had their way, two-thirds of these work journeys, that is, about a quarter of a million, would be done in private cars. Once again, the group arrived at a theoretical network for the whole city. Now, this would be a practical proposition in the outer parts, but there were great difficulties applying it to the center, which attracts so much more traffic. What possible pattern of roads and junctions could be devised for these dense 2,000 acres? First, they tried a pattern that they called rings and radials, but it didn't work. You see the spacing of these intersections near the center. If they had enough roads to serve the center properly, the intersections would have to be so close together that the approach roads would overlap. It just wouldn't be physically possible to get them all in. They drew up several other theoretical schemes, but try as they might, Buchanan and his team could not find room for all the cars they forecast would use the roads in central Leeds. To do this would have meant raising the city center to the ground. So instead, Buchanan adopted a compromise solution and scale down the target to one of fitting in as many cars as possible. Buchanan's chapter on Leeds was an academic exercise in solving the city's traffic problems. A few years later, Leeds City Council began to build its own multi-million pound network of roads, which closely resembled those shown in the Buchanan report. Leeds Council was so proud of its achievement that it promoted its image with the phrase, motorway city of the 70s. One aim of the council scheme was to divert traffic away from the city centre and some of the shopping streets were blocked off and given over entirely to pedestrians. The segregation of pedestrians and traffic was also a major theme of the Buchanan Report. It contains a great deal about making shopping areas safe. But segregation also facilitates uninterrupted traffic flows. Pedestrian precincts were a natural outcome of this idea. But nice as they seem, they are usually difficult to get to for people without cars because of the encircling motorways. They are certainly an aid to shopping, but good shopping facilities are not all that pedestrians need. The Victorians also had pedestrian precincts, 
the arcades. But unlike modern precincts, they were an extra comfort in a city where you could expect to walk anywhere. The motorway cuts off the centre of Leeds from the suburbs, making it difficult to reach except by car. If the Buchanan team's idea had been followed more closely, the shopping area would have been far more isolated. His network of motorways would have completely encircled the centre. It would have also driven wedges between the various suburbs. Headingley, a suburb to the north of Leeds, was one of the areas selected by Buchanan for detailed study. He wanted to allow as many cars as possible into the centre of Leeds. Because Headingley was on the route from the northern suburbs to the city centre, motorways and other new roads would have to be built through it. It's a quiet inner suburb, which is only separated from the city centre by a small park. It's mainly residential and has a mixture of Victorian villas and terraced houses. Despite being a suburb, it has a strong local identity and people will say that they come from Headingley rather than Leeds. Traffic is not a major nuisance, except in the shopping area, which lies on the main road. Buchanan identified this as being a serious problem. He proposed a bypass around the shopping area, which would have enabled it to be made into a pedestrian-only street. But the full scheme was more than just a bypass. A network of motorways completed the plans, which would have chopped the district up and separated communities. If the roads had been built, it would no longer be possible to leave the house, to stroll down to the park, or to walk on across it into town. It's easy to imagine what the motorway network might have done to Headingley, because roads of this kind have been driven through the southern suburbs of Hunslet and Holbeck. In between the motorways, which weave through the area, were meant to be small havens of peace and quiet, environmental areas, as Buchanan called them. Buchanan's idea was that although new roads would require demolition of buildings on a vast scale, the roads would take traffic out of the remaining areas, which would therefore be conserved. He really didn't look in an awful lot of detail at what conditions really would have been like in these areas, because the highways which surrounded them clearly would have had an effect which extended into much of these environmental areas in terms of noise generation, in terms of fumes and in terms of dust. And it's very probable that such environmental areas, certainly as designed and as shown in his report, would have been unworkable. Many towns and cities which followed Buchanan's ideas found that the places carefully designed as environmental areas turned out to be pockets of noise and pollution. Buchanan stressed the importance of preserving the past. To avoid demolishing historic buildings, motorways have often been carefully routed round them, but it's arguable whether this way of preserving things has any value. Motorways are not self-contained strips. They bleed out into the surroundings. Traditional towns were usually wrecked by the attempt to remodel them in the way that Buchanan suggested. He had, in any case, concluded that such towns were obsolete. His ideas were a strong influence at the planning stage of new towns. Washington itself, like the car created in it, is planned for the motor age. In 1964, the government designated Washington, a new town near Newcastle upon Tyne. Its planners wrongly assumed that most of the intended 80,000 people would have a car. They adopted the grid system, an American idea advocated by Buchanan. The master plan is based on a network of motorways. They're linked at regular intervals with the secondary road system. 
The transportation network is central to the whole planning of the new town. Residential areas are free from the discomforts and noise of through industrial traffic. Each village is encircled by its own perimeter road to leave the centre safe for pedestrians. But a town doesn't just exist for the passage of motor cars. A town is for its citizens, now and in the future. Washington is just one instance of 1960s planning. The car was dominant. People were a very poor second. Although this was by then a common approach, there were a few instances when ideas were incorporated in plans which had an entirely different perception of people's travel needs. The city planned in North Buckinghamshire, halfway between London and Birmingham, proposed to have a high quality transport service. Public transport was an integral part of the plan for the city. Although the houses would be spread out over a large area in a way which would allow a high level of car ownership, the residential areas were strung along a public transport route. Like beads on a string, they were clustered around the stations so that everyone would be within easy reach of public transport. The city was to be as futuristic in its choice of transport as it was in the design of its buildings. Public transport was to be provided by a monorail. Every now and again, planners become obsessed with the possibilities of monorails. A monorail link from central London to Heathrow Airport was mooted in the 1950s. It was to be built over the existing railway lines. The rail plane of 1927 was an attempt to combine railway and aircraft technology. This too was designed to be built over existing railway routes and promised speeds of over 100 miles an hour. More recently, there was the tracked hovercraft, which hovered over its central rail. It was designed for running at high speeds between cities. Like the rail plane, it was very noisy and was abandoned in the early 70s in favor of developing the advanced passenger train. There are several other monorails around the world, but they are mostly prototypes. The technology remains largely unproven, and when cities have decided to build a new public transport system, they've invariably stuck to the conventional trains and buses. The plan to have a monorail in the North Buckinghamshire town was dropped, and shortly afterwards, the whole idea for a new town was abandoned. Some years later, in 1971, a very different type of new town was designated on the same site. Milton Keynes feels like a town designed for the car. Motorways sweep through it. Signposts are the only evidence that you're in the town. It all looks very nice, but it only works if you have a car. Most of the houses in Milton Keynes have garages, and the influence of the car is everywhere. In this town of the future, the idea of walking to the local shops is outmoded. So the shops are built around a car park. People are encouraged to drive for even the smallest purchase. Public transport is poor. The buses only operate at half hourly intervals and fares are higher than average. At least a third of the people do not have a car. An attempt was made to set up a minibus service which was called by phone like a taxi. It was very popular but uneconomic and was scrapped in the late 1970s with the cutbacks in the whole bus system. The plans for Milton Keynes provided for full car ownership and public transport was fitted in to what was essentially a town for cars. Surprisingly though, the master plan stressed that a high quality public transport system was essential. At a later stage, the planning team recognized that the layout of the town would not allow for a good public transport system. Strangely, there was no attempt to alter the plan. The goal of good public transport was simply dropped. Despite the opportunities at the planning stage, Milton Keynes is no better off in transport terms than many old towns.
A significant proportion of the population have extreme difficulty getting about because they do not have a car, and in many cases can't afford one. And the provision of a good public transport network over such a spread out area is economically crippling. In new towns, high car ownership has been accommodated, but at the expense of providing good public transport. In old towns, no amount of rebuilding has adequately accommodated the car, and attempts to do this has usually resulted in poorer public transport. In the early 60s, when Buchanan's plans were published, people were already talking about restricting traffic in towns. How do you restrict traffic? This is a very difficult point, of which we haven't much experience so far. There are various possible methods. A system of permits for entry into defined zones. A system of pricing the use of road space. Or, and this is very important, you could control the amount of parking, where you provide it, and how much you charge for it. But in the long run, a great deal is going to depend on public understanding of the position and on the maintenance of good public transport. Buchanan may have mentioned the need to maintain good public transport, but there was little he could do about it. The minister had specifically excluded public transport from Buchanan's terms of reference, even though buses are very much a part of traffic in turns and would be affected by any proposals for changing traffic patterns. But Buchanan also showed little interest in the whole public transport question and how it related to the use of cars. One assumption which was fundamental to Buchanan's argument was that a state of full car ownership would be reached within 50 years of writing the report, the year 2010. Predictions are rarely right. The growth in car ownership has been slower than Buchanan forecast. But even if he had been correct, the emphasis put on cars seems misplaced. When society reached the state of full car ownership, according to Buchanan, there would be 405 cars for every thousand people car owners would be the minority, and only a minority of this minority would enjoy free use of their cars. Buchanan showed that no matter how much investment was poured into rebuilding for the car, only a small percentage of car owners would be able to drive to work. The most costly of his scheme for Leeds was for 40% of car owners, and for London, his best figure was 30%. To put it another way, 79% of people, that is car owners and non-car owners, travelling to work in London would find themselves dependent on public transport, even after £6,000 million had been spent on new motorways and car parks. The report can be read to show that a comprehensive network of public transport would be essential, but this conflicted with government thinking. Traffic in towns appeared a few months after Dr Beeching delivered his devastating report on the railways, which proposed closing down one-third of the network. The Minister of Transport was a close associate of Dr. Beeching's and had welcomed his proposals enthusiastically. With the Minister's blessing, Beeching quickly set about running down the railways, closing lines and stations. Rural areas as well as towns were affected, and many vital links were closed, isolating towns. It was the beginning of a period when many people, even those who could least afford it, were forced to buy a car. The motorway programme was already underway, the minister chose to emphasize the sections of the Buchanan report which legitimized his existing policies. He issued a directive to local councils instructing them to draw up plans in keeping with the Buchanan report. Remodeling towns for the car became the dominant thinking in transport planning from the 60s. Most of today's cities bear the mark of an attitude that puts cars before people.